Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. We are about to launch a surveillance testing uh, approach. University ingenuity in the age of COVID-19. The storm surge scooped up sediment sludge. The wrath of Laura is long gone, but its toxic mess is emerging. It looks like a war zone. One family's life-changing experience after Hurricane Laura ripped through their lives. Never run a generator inside of a home, never run it inside of a garage. Life-saving information after several die of carbon monoxide poisoning after Hurricane Laura. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those top stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, today marks the 19th anniversary of 9-11. Nearly 3,000 people were killed on September 11, 2001 in the attack of the World Trade Center in New York. It's remembered as the U.S. faces another deadly crisis that is not over, the coronavirus. And in our state, the latest numbers show 41 more coronavirus deaths mean more than 5,000 have now lost their lives because of the virus in our state. Governor John Bell Edwards announcing today after six months, the state is moving into phase three. Looser restrictions for most businesses, except in New Orleans, and masks remain mandatory. The order continues to recommend uh, the most basic of all of the CDC uh, recommendations, uh, and that is those uh, at higher risk of, of severe illness from COVID-19 continue to realize they are safer at home, uh, and they should not go out and, and certainly should avoid large crowds um, unless there's some sort of essential activity that they need to engage in, such as getting food or medical care. Um, and this order will be in place for uh, 28 days, uh, expiring on October the 9th. And now we'll look at other headlines making news across our state. The heat death of a 58-year-old woman in central Louisiana is the 27th attributed by the state to Hurricane Laura. The state health department says the woman lived in a trailer home without electricity or air conditioning. The storm caused major power outages and destroyed the power grid in Lake Charles. FEMA has approved two additional parishes, Union and Morehouse, for help in the aftermath of Laura. People in 18 parishes are now eligible for FEMA assistance. The governor is urging residents affected by the storm to register. Clouds of mosquitoes have been so thick in the southwest part of the state, they're killing cattle and horses. Farmers in a five-parish area east and northeast of where the storm made landfall say they've lost hundreds of animals. Veterinarians say the swarms cause a vast number of bites that leave horses and cattle anemic and bleeding under their skins. The state's election commissioner testified this week about concerns over the volume of absentee mail ballots that are expected to delay tabulation of results for the November 3rd election. Testimony was in a lawsuit filed by voting rights advocates who say the current state plan is not adequate. The mayor of Vidalia confirmed he has tested positive for COVID-19. Mayor Buzz Kraft says his symptoms have been minor and he is quarantined at home. He's also reaching out to anyone he may have come in contact with. The start of the high school football season in the state has been moved up a week, now scheduled to begin October 1st through 3rd. It means full contact workouts have now begun. Athletic officials say the plan to move forward would have happened whether the state was in phase two or phase three of the virus.
A check now on universities and fall classes with coronavirus happening. Louisiana Tech had to postpone a football game with Baylor because of a COVID outbreak. I talked with UL System President Jim Henderson and LSU President Tom Galligan. My visit with Galligan came hours after LSU announced how Tiger Stadium would look. 25% capacity with everyone wearing masks. It's going to be different. It's going to be fewer people, but uh, for those 25,000 people, they will be in Tiger Stadium at an LSU football game. We are uh, going to announce to our students that what we want is to go to the game, you have to have been tested. It's, it's not whether you're positive or negative per se. Obviously, if you're positive, you shouldn't go to the game, but it's really just an, in, it's an incentive to get our students to avail themselves of the testing that we have on campus. How are things working out with classes and the students that are attending classes? How's it going so far? Uh, I, I would say, uh, Andre, so far it's going pretty darn well. People are wearing their masks when they're in class. We have had not had one episode of someone who said, I'm not gonna wear my mask in class. People are wearing their masks for the most part in the quad. Occasionally you'll see students in a group outside without masks and we're encouraging those students when you're in a group like that, uh, wear the mask because if you're in close contact for 15 minutes with someone and they test positive, then you're going to have to quarantine. We have, as of Wednesday at 4 p.m., we had 673 positive cases since the first day of school. That obviously concerns us. We have students in isolation. We have students in quarantine. We're taking care of them and we're reminding them, you know, we're here for you, but please keep doing the right thing. Keep wearing the mask, keep washing your hands, keep sneezing into your elbow. And something else that we're implementing is a couple of our faculty members have been doing wastewater testing for the city. And we're ramping that up on campus as well uh, so that we can have wastewater test results for groups of residence halls and about the three to 500 group of students in the residence halls. And that's a way for us to see a potential increase in the disease before somebody might be symptomatic and then we can deploy our testing resources in those necessary places. How often are students tested? Right now, as, as often as they want. We have testing capacity right now for tests on demand. We're not requiring it. We're strongly advising everyone go and get tested. If that doesn't work, then we may move to mandatory, at least in certain situations. And these are rapid result tests? Some are three days, some are within 24 hours. Is there an option for students who aren't comfortable being on campus for them to do anything virtual right now? Yeah, we, uh, Andre, we emphasized choice from the start. So if a student doesn't want to be in a person-to-person -person class, they can be 100% online. Faculty members were offered the choice. Do you want to teach in the classroom? Do you want to teach online? So those that didn't feel safe, either they, they had some underlying factor, they just didn't feel safe, we gave them the option to teach online. So we've really maximized choice from the beginning. It's not the typical campus scene. And while we miss that a lot, one of the benefits of that is that the population on campus at any moment it is not as dense as it normally is. We started this process uh, on March 9th of this year and declared that everything we do will be, uh, will have the health and safety of faculty, staff, and students as a paramount concern. And we've done that to a great extent in terms of the classroom setting. There's always that variable of human behavior. And so we've been focused on educating students and faculty and, and staff about physical distancing, about uh, personal protective equipment, mask, and hygiene. And so we've created the safest environments we can, but there is prevalence of, of this virus still in our communities at large. And certainly that means there'll be prevalence on our campuses as well. So most of our campuses have reported in somewhere between 20 and, and 100 cases cumulative. But that's self-reported information. And so we, we can't deceive ourselves and think that that's the limit of the virus. Explain to me uh, the dashboard system across the UL campuses. 
So, so we have campuses that are that right now have their own dashboards that are up that are reporting uh, the number of cases that have been reported to them. Uh, but LDH has worked with the higher ed community to develop a, a different kind of dashboard that I think will be even more practical for making one uh, health public health policy decisions and two for the, at the individual level making decisions about your own health and, and, and well-being. It'll have a cumulative number of cases reported on our campuses. It'll have uh, ca uh, cases reported within a certain window so you can start to see trends. This is new territory for all of us. If you didn't live through the 1918 flu epidemic, which most of us didn't, forget the gray hair, then, then this is new territory. Unfortunately, it's part of a new reality. And I think though, if we make science-based decisions and we adjust our behaviors based on the science and we implement policy and practice based on the science, then we can overcome this. And that's, that's really what we're focused on. They evacuated before Hurricane Laura tore through Lake Charles a couple of weeks ago, and they feel fortunate that their family, they are safe, and their homes were not totally destroyed. But now the Capels are struggling to pick up the pieces of their lives still scattered about during a pandemic. We talked to them about the difficulties they and many other families are facing. They are one of hundreds of Lake Charles families that have had their lives turned upside down. Sarah Capel is a fourth grade teacher. You know, there, there's downed trees and power lines in houses that are destroyed in every direction that you look in every on every street that you go down the best way to describe it it looks like a war zone it's it's unbelievable and we had seen photographs of you know our houses and some videos and things of the area but it really just doesn't convey what you see in person edward her husband is an artist yeah it's pretty much any route that i've taken into the city, it's been the same thing. It looks to me like a 30 mile wide tornado came through. In terms of direct hit for wind damage, it was the perfect storm to tear Lake Charles up. What does your home look like? Our home is, is nested. We have three homes around us, which help as a buffer. So we need new roofing. We had some water damage, but when we have electricity, we'll be able to get back in our house. I think my parents' house got hit much harder, has extensive roof damage, took on a lot of water during the storm and a lot of trees. I think um, their neighbor kind of behind them knows when all the trees snapped. It sounds like a tornado had gone through the property. So uh, it, it has much more extensive damage. My brother's house uh, has some water damage and pretty much every house needs new roofing. Some houses are unlivable, quite a few are unlivable, and there's the occasional house that it didn't look like anything happened. Those are few and far between. They're few and far between, but, but there's some that look completely unaffected, that they were just in the right spot at the right time. For 14-year-old Zoe Capel, who was ready to start high school, those plans are on hold until she finds a school. I don't know, it was just very disappointing and not being able to do school and I haven't been in school in like six months because we had to end early because of the pandemic so we've been looking for schools and just like questioning whether we should wait for my school to open or if we should like open virtually or if we should just enroll in a different one and just do virtual like the whole entire time so I don't know that's been a little bit difficult trying to find a school and there are difficulties in many other areas, too, as a family waits to have their power restored so they can make their home livable again. It's a lot yeah. to, to process because everything is affected. All the stores and restaurants and, you know, there's a lot of places that are completely destroyed. But pretty much everything on the main streets like Ryan Street and Crean Lake took significant damage. And, you know, coming in, I thought that I was going to, you know, be overwhelmed emotionally at what I saw, but you get there and you just go into help mode. And the three days and nights that I was there with Ned, we just were so busy. You didn't have time to really process everything you were seeing. And um, I'll say, I guess, a silver lining 
is seeing the community come together, seeing the people coming in from other places and cooking and helping. It, it's really something to see. Yeah, that, that aspect is really beautiful. Neighbors really getting to know each other, having the opportunity to help being able to receive help, but also give help. When something like this happens, it takes a while to, to recover. Even if you can physically recover, mentally you have to recover. How do you guys go about that process? One day at a time. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, a lot of the small businesses in our area were hurting financially. Now they're hurting physically on top of that. And I have three friends that I know of that have already put out on Facebook where we're not returning, you know, our businesses, we just can't do it. You know, I think one day at a time, one piece at a time, it'll be difficult to do. And, you know, is it something that you want to bring your kids and your family into to just struggle for several years? You know, I think that's a big question for a lot of people. From what I heard of friends who went through the rebuild of Katrina, you know, it takes a couple of years just for the psyche of the community to begin to become a little bit more positive because you're going to see a lot of blighted properties that aren't being dealt with. And it just takes the logistics that it takes to rebuild a city in mass, as is this case and was New Orleans. And until life gets somewhat back to normal, for many, moving around is something they're being forced to get used to. With this evacuation, I have a coworker who has been in four different places with her family for different reasons, just trying to find something permanent to accommodate a family. And, um, you know, my mom was with us and because of COVID, she's high risk, she's elderly. That was a big issue of finding her a place where she could stay isolated. So she's been in two different places in New Orleans and probably will go to a third, you know, just trying to keep her isolated. So, you know, I think that's another issue for a lot of families. We'll be following the journey of the Capella family as they work to repair their home, their lives and their community. Laura caused significant damage to a site that holds 30% of the nation's storage of emergency crude oil. The damaged Strategic Petroleum Reserve is in West Hackberry, that's just north of Cameron. I talked with Wilma Subra. She's a pioneer in environmental chemistry and an advocate for those impacted by toxins that infiltrate their lives. In our state, when a hurricane hits a region that's heavy in petrochemical, which is every region just about, but particularly Lake Charles. What happens, especially when it's a strong storm like this, what takes place? So in association with this Hurricane Laura, there was a storm surge and very, very high winds. So the storm surge scooped up sediment sludge throughout the estuary area and brought it on shore. And the industrial facilities especially the storage tanks leak into the secondary containment, which then got distributed throughout the environment. And so when you go in that area, you see lots of crude oil or oil stains on property, on structures, on the soil. And so it's really critical that the community understand that these are very toxic substances and they must be very careful when going in and trying to assess the damage to their homes or their businesses, and also not coming to direct contact with all of these hydrocarbon-based materials. That's never the first thing that is reported or thought about or makes the headlines, but after a week or so, it becomes, oh yeah, well look at this now, there's a giant oil sheen here, or there's a problem here. And that is normal because they're used to having flaring events. They're used to having emission events. Mm -hmm. And the people just sort of ignore it. And then after a time, you all of a sudden take a second look and say, it's all over the place. The issue becomes the individuals going back and assessing the damage and determining how they're going to either remedy the damage. 
or move out of the area. But that's when they become contaminated when they are going in on their property and in the structures and they're not aware of it. And so the issue becomes a need to evaluate how extensive and what contaminants are there and determine what has to be done to remedy it. So when you have all the insurance inspectors going in, they're looking at structural damage, not necessarily contamination. So the inspectors need to be made aware that there's a potential for contamination in these areas and that should be evaluated as well as the structural damage. Is that something that is the responsibility of the homeowner or whatever is being evaluated? So the homeowner needs to be aware and observe, but the inspectors are the ones going to go in and determine how, how much you get back from your insurance coverage. And then once they do that, the homeowner has to decide if they're going to hire a contractor and if they need sampling in the area before they hire a contractor to remedy the situation. The areas along the fence line of the industrial facilities, but also the areas where the storm surge came in because the entire estuary in that area is contaminated from historical operations. Some of those facilities were built in the 40s as a war effort and they discharged lots of toxic chemicals into the estuary. So if you were in an area that the storm surge brought sediment sludge onto your property, that is potentially contaminated and that's what you should be paying attention to and evaluating. Mossville had a lot of sediment sludge contamination from previous hurricanes and it was they were highly contaminated as well as the community of Mossville has dioxin in their blood at three times the national average and that's from both inhaling it from emissions but also from consuming the fish and the fruit in their yard and the vegetables in their yard and the nuts from their trees. And if you go back to DEQ's files, you'll see tens of thousands of containers that DEQ has had to deal with after each hurricane that were just swept away by the storm surge. So you don't want people coming in contact with pieces of contaminants that are out there in the environment. Be very, very careful. Several lives lost in the aftermath of Hurricane Laura were a result of improper use of portable generators. Laura destroyed large parts of Louisiana's power grid after making landfall with winds of 150 miles per hour, destroying everything in her path. We talk with experts with the Baton Rouge Fire Department to get a few generator safety reminders that could save your life. When the most powerful storm since 1856 tore through the Lake Charles area, ripping off roofs and snapping trees, many were hunkered down in their homes riding out the storm. Five members of the Lewis family were among those who sheltered in place, surviving the storm's wrath, only to fall victim to the colorless, odorless, tasteless gas, carbon monoxide. What we want to make sure that we stress is never run a generator inside of a home, never run it inside of a garage. Even if you have the door up, those gases can still build up in the home. And when we have them outside of the home, make sure that we're keeping that generator at least five feet away from the building, five feet, five feet away from any openings. Like look up, you have vent openings in your soffit. Those gases can build up in there as well. Don't keep it next to a window. All these things are things that we want people to remember. Justin Hill, public information officer for the Baton Rouge Fire Department says those tips can literally save your life and are something we should take note of several times a year, not just during hurricane season. Any time of the year we, we see a big drive of, you know, generator safety during the summertime, during hurricane season. But like you mentioned, these storms happen year round, not just hurricanes, but in the wintertime we have ice storms every so often, you know, and just thunderstorms roll through, we'll lose power. It doesn't even have to be a storm. It could be an NVA that caused a power outage and we may be out for an extended period of time. And, you know, losing power is just something we're not new to down here. For many in and around the Calcasieu Parish area, the power is still out and will likely be out for several more weeks. Even more reason to take extra precautions when using a portable generator. 
just stay on top of it. Don't get complacent. You know, make sure we're keeping it away from the building when we're refueling it and changing the oil. Make sure the engine is cooled down completely because it's not just the carbon monoxide that's the hazard of dealing with these. We can also deal with fires where we're refueling the generator while it's hot and things of that nature. So just I know it's overwhelming during these storm situations, but we just got to make sure that safety is always at the forefront. It is referred to as a silent killer. Here are several tips to make sure that we are safe while using generators to supply power. These you can find this generator safety category. video on the Baton Rouge Always Fire Department connect. Facebook page as they continue to try to educate the community about how to safely use a generator to power a home. The video points out the Consumer Product Safety Commission report that says 100 people die each year from carbon monoxide poisoning and it only takes a few minutes to be overcome by the fumes that can take your life. It all depends on the concentration and it may be inside of five minutes for a high concentration but that's not only the hazard if you just got a little bit seeping in on, into that house over over time, the longer that you stay in there, your body's grabbing onto that carbon monoxide more readily than the oxygen. So those levels of buildup in your bloodstream, even though you don't have a high concentration inside the home. So it's you can't smell it, you can't see it, you can't taste it. But if you start exhibiting those signs and symptoms of exposure, headache, dizziness, weakness, confusion, these are signs, you know, telling you that, hey, if something's going on, we need to call 911 and get help. And for those who've used a generator in an open garage or too close to their home to stop someone from stealing it, experts say don't take what could be a deadly chance with your life. Unfortunately, that's something that we do have to contend with during these times. And what I would suggest is maybe chaining it to something, finding it some way to secure it outside of the home to where you're not worried about it walking off. And Hill encourages everyone to buy a carbon monoxide detector just in case the fumes enter your home. You'll get an early warning to get out. Hall of Famer Lou Brock, one of baseball's signature leadoff hitters and base dealers who led the St. Louis Cardinals to a pair of World Series titles in the 1960s, died this week. He was born in Arkansas but grew up in Collinson, Louisiana, the seventh of nine children. He attended Southern University on an academic scholarship and became a baseball great. He became an LPB Louisiana legend in 2002. Lou Brock was 81 years old. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.